If you want to unlock true freedom, you need to master one thing your mindset. This timeless truth, echoed by the ancient philosopher Epictetus, holds as much power today as it did centuries ago. The best wisdom I've ever heard comes from this stoic sage, who believed that while we can't control what happens to us, we can always control how we respond. Think about it. How many times have you felt frustrated, anxious, or defeated by circumstances outside your control? Maybe it was a harsh comment from a colleague, a missed opportunity, or even a personal setback. Epictetus would tell you this, you're giving away your power. Avoid this mistake if you want true inner peace. Instead of wrestling with things you can't change, learn to focus on what you can, your thoughts, actions, and perspective. In this video, we'll dive deep into the transformative teachings of Epictetus, exploring how they can help you navigate the chaos of modern life with resilience, purpose, and serenity. From finding peace in the worst-case scenario to embracing contentment as the ultimate wealth of the soul, get ready to discover how ancient wisdom can revolutionize your life. Let's begin. Number 1. The Wisdom of Epictetus in Modern Life Imagine standing on a serene hilltop, gazing at the endless horizon. The air is crisp, the view stunning, and for a brief moment you feel invincible. That feeling of peace is what many of us chase daily, a sense of control amidst chaos, a glimpse of balance in our lives. Epictetus, a former slave who became one of the greatest Stoic philosophers, believed this tranquility wasn't just a fleeting moment, it was a way of life. His teachings have survived centuries because they resonate with an eternal truth, the power to find peace lies within us. But let's step back for a second. Why is this relevant to you? Because the world today is noisier than ever. Notifications bombard our phones. Expectations crush us. Every decision feels like a battle against time. Epictetus taught that while we cannot control the world, we can control how we respond to it. And this idea isn't just philosophy. It's the manual we've been missing for navigating the complexities of modern life. Think about a moment when everything seemed to spiral out of control. Maybe it was a missed promotion or a fight with a loved one. That overwhelming wave of helplessness felt insurmountable. Epictetus would ask, what part of this is truly yours to control? He believed that once we separate what we can control, our thoughts, actions and emotions, from what we can't, the storm quiets. Remember a time when life was simpler perhaps in childhood. Back then, happiness came from small things, an ice cream cone on a summer day, a favorite cartoon, or just running through the grass. What changed? Somewhere along the way, we started focusing on things outside our control, validation from others, chasing material success, fearing failure. Epictetus reminds us to strip back to essentials and find joy in what's within our grasp. Curious about how his ancient wisdom fits into today's world? Think about it, the emails, the endless scroll of social media, the race to outdo peers. Epictetus would say these are distractions. His philosophy isn't about rejecting modernity, but about mastering it. What would your life look like if you stopped reacting to every external trigger? If you learned to pause, reflect, and act only on what truly matters. Number 2. The Art of Listening. Silence as Strength. Picture this, you're at a party, surrounded by friends, and the conversation flows effortlessly. Laughter fills the air, but there's always that one person, the storyteller who captivates everyone the secret to their charm. It's not just their words, but their ability to listen. Yes, listening is a superpower, and Epictetus recognized it long before psychology backed it up. He once said, we have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. It's a simple observation, but profoundly powerful. 
In a world where everyone is shouting to be heard, the ability to listen has become rare and invaluable. Why? Because listening isn't just about hearing words, it's about understanding emotions, intentions, and the person behind those words. Let's delve into the core of this idea. Listening, Epictetus believed, isn't passive. It's an active skill, a discipline that demands patience and humility. When you listen, you step outside your ego. It's no longer about proving a point or being right. It's about connecting, learning and growing. Think about the last time someone truly listened to you. Didn't it feel like a gift? Imagine being able to offer that gift to others. Now let's reflect. In our younger years, conversations felt more genuine. Perhaps it was because we were less distracted or more present. Remember those late night talks with friends, the ones where you shared dreams, fears and secrets. Those moments weren't just about talking, they were about being heard and understood. Somewhere along the way, as life got busier, we lost that magic. Here's the curiosity, how can we reclaim it? Epictetus's teachings on listening aren't just about improving relationships, they're about mastering ourselves. When we listen, we learn not only about others, but also about our reactions and judgments. What if, in your next conversation, you focused entirely on the other person? No interruptions, no thinking of what to say next. Just presence. The results might surprise you. Number 3. Mastering your emotions. Staying unshaken by others. Imagine waking up to a perfect morning. The sun is shining, your coffee smells heavenly, and everything feels right. Then, out of nowhere, someone cuts you off in traffic, or a snide comment from a co-worker ruins your mood. Your peace shatters, and frustration takes over. It's astounding how quickly we let others dictate our emotional state. But what if they didn't have that power? What if you could remain calm no matter what? Epictetus argued that our emotions are not reactions to the world, but reflections of our perceptions. He believed that nothing has the power to disturb us unless we grant it. This isn't about suppressing emotions, but understanding them. Why does someone's rude comment sting? Because we assign meaning to it. What if you chose not to? Think about a time when someone upset you deeply. Maybe it was a heated argument, a betrayal, or just a bad day compounded by someone's carelessness. The hurt felt raw, uncontrollable. Now think about how much of that pain came from the event itself, and how much from replaying it in your mind, magnifying its impact. Epictetus would say that by changing our perspective, we reclaim our power. Do you remember a moment of emotional mastery in your life? Maybe it was staying composed in a tough situation or forgiving someone who hurt you. Those moments are rare, but profoundly empowering. They remind us that while we can't control others, we can control our reactions. Curious to explore this further? Consider the idea of emotional triggers. Most of us spend our lives reacting to criticism, to praise, to circumstances. Epictetus teaches us to pause. When you feel anger, frustration or sadness creeping in, ask yourself, why am I giving this power? The world doesn't stop being chaotic, but with practice, you can be the calm in the storm. What would it feel like to live a life where your peace wasn't at the mercy of others? The answer lies in mastering your emotions, one reaction at a time. Number four, finding peace in the worst case scenario. Picture this, you're standing in the rain, drenched to the bone without an umbrella. Your car broke down miles from home, your phone battery is dead, and your plans for the day are ruined. Frustration starts bubbling up. The situation feels insurmountable, yet it's here, in this moment, where Epictetus's teachings shine brightest. He believed peace isn't found in avoiding problems, but in embracing them. Epictetus taught that the worst-case scenario is often where we discover our inner strength. He said, Man is not worried by real problems, 
so much as by his imagined anxieties about real problems. In simpler terms, the fear of what could go wrong often causes more suffering than the event itself. Think about it. How often have you found yourself agonizing over potential disasters that never happened? And even when they did, you likely managed them better than you anticipated. Let's explore the core of this idea. Life is unpredictable, filled with setbacks and challenges. Epictetus believed that peace comes from preparing for adversity, not from avoiding it. He encouraged practicing negative visualization, a stoic exercise where you imagine the worst possible outcomes. Why? Not to dwell on negativity, but to strip fear of its power. By confronting the worst, you remind yourself of your resilience. Think back to a challenging time in your life, perhaps a job loss, a breakup, or a health scare. At that moment, it felt like the world was crashing down. Yet here you are, still standing. The storm passed, and in its wake, you emerged stronger. These experiences, painful as they were, shaped your character and taught you lessons you couldn't learn any other way. Curiosity lies in this question. What if the worst case scenario isn't as terrifying as it seems? Consider the story of James Stockdale, a US Navy admiral who survived years of torture as a prisoner of war. A devoted student of Stoicism, he credited Epictetus's teachings for his resilience. Stockdale accepted his suffering, but refused to be broken by it, embodying the Stoic principle of finding peace within. Could we, too, face our worst fears with such courage? The answer lies in embracing life's challenges as opportunities to grow. Number 5. Turning failures into stepping stones. Failure. Just hearing the word can bring a wave of discomfort. It's that knot in your stomach, the sting of regret, the echo of, what if I had done things differently? But what if failure isn't the end of the road? What if it's a signpost pointing you toward growth? Epictetus believed failure isn't something to fear, but a teacher disguised in disappointment. Imagine this scenario you've poured your heart and soul into a project, only to see it fall apart. The initial reaction is heartbreak, maybe even anger. Epictetus, however, would remind us that failure is external. It's what you choose to do next that defines its impact. His wisdom it is not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters, shifts the narrative. It's not about the fall, but the rise. At its core, failure is feedback. It tells you what didn't work and offers a chance to adjust your approach. Consider Thomas Edison, who famously said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. He understood that each setback brought him closer to success. Epictetus would argue that this mindset turns obstacles into opportunities. Now, let's get nostalgic. Think back to a time when you failed at something important, a test, a job interview, or even a relationship. At the time, it may have felt like the end of the world. But looking back, can you see how that failure shaped you? Maybe it led to a better opportunity or taught you a critical lesson. Those moments of failure, painful as they were, became stepping stones to where you are now. Curiosity compels us to ask, what would life look like if you embraced failure as a necessary part of growth? Epictetus teaches that failure isn't a reflection of your worth, but a challenge to improve. The next time you face it, instead of asking, why me? Ask, what can I learn from this? The answers might just change your perspective forever. Number 6. The Beauty of Simplicity A Path to True Happiness Close your eyes and imagine a quiet morning. The sun filters through the curtains, a gentle breeze carries the scent of fresh coffee, and the world feels still. In this simplicity, there's a profound sense of happiness. Epictetus believed that the simpler life is, the happier we become. He argued that true joy isn't found in abundance,
but in appreciating what we already have. We live in a culture of excess, constantly bombarded by advertisements telling us we need more. The newest phone, the fastest car, the trendiest clothes. Yet paradoxically, these things often leave us feeling empty. Epictetus would say this happens because external possessions can never satisfy internal desires. Happiness, he believed, comes from within, from aligning your wants with your needs. At its heart, simplicity isn't about deprivation, it's about focus. It's about clearing the clutter, both physical and emotional, to make space for what truly matters. Think about the joy of a heartfelt conversation, the warmth of a loved one's embrace, or the satisfaction of creating something meaningful. These moments, often overlooked, are where happiness truly resides. Nostalgia brings us back to childhood when life was less complicated. Remember playing with a favorite toy or spending hours outdoors lost in imagination. Back then, happiness didn't come from having everything, but from cherishing what you had. As adults, we often lose sight of that simplicity, drowning in the pursuit of more. Here's where curiosity takes over. What if you stripped away the excess? What if you focused on experiences over possessions, on relationships over status? Epictetus challenges us to question what we truly need to be happy. By embracing simplicity, we might discover that happiness was never out of reach. It was waiting in the moments we often overlook. Number seven, the value of humility, letting go of ego. Imagine standing at the top of a mountain, looking out over a vast horizon. In that moment, it's impossible not to feel small, humbled by the sheer magnitude of the world around you. This is the power of humility, the ability to see yourself as part of something greater without letting ego cloud your perspective. For Epictetus, humility wasn't just a virtue, it was a necessity for living a meaningful life. At its core, humility is about recognizing that we don't have all the answers, and that's okay. In a world that often rewards arrogance and self-promotion, humility offers a counterbalance. It invites us to listen more, judge less, and approach life with an open mind. Epictetus taught that ego is a barrier to growth, blinding us to our faults and preventing us from learning. If anyone tells you that a certain person speaks ill of you, he wrote, do not make excuses about what is said of you, but answer, he was ignorant of my other faults, else he would not have mentioned these alone. Humility allows us to accept criticism without defensiveness and to view it as an opportunity for self-improvement. Think back to a time when you let ego dictate your actions. Maybe it was an argument where you refused to admit you were wrong or a moment when you dismissed someone else's perspective because you were too focused on your own. How did that turn out? Most likely it led to tension, regret or missed opportunities. Now contrast that with a time when you approached a situation with humility. The outcomes were likely far more positive, fostering understanding and connection. Curiosity nudges us to explore. What if we practiced humility in our daily lives? How might our relationships improve? How much more could we learn if we admitted we didn't know it all? Humility isn't about diminishing yourself. It's about creating space for growth, understanding and true connection. Number eight, navigating wealth with wisdom and integrity. Wealth is a paradox. On one hand, it can provide comfort, security and opportunities. On the other, it can lead to greed, corruption and a never-ending pursuit of more. Epictetus viewed wealth not as inherently good or bad, but as a tool, its value determined by how we use it. His wisdom reminds us that integrity, not riches, is the true measure of a person. Picture this. You've just received an unexpected financial windfall. The excitement is palpable, but so is the temptation to splurge or flaunt it. Epictetus would ask, does this money serve your virtues 
or does it enslave you? Wealth, he believed, should never compromise your principles. Instead, it should be used to uplift others and foster a life of purpose. At its core, navigating wealth with wisdom means understanding its limits. Money can buy comfort, but not happiness. Luxury, but not contentment. Consider the countless stories of lottery winners who, despite their sudden riches, found their lives spiraling into chaos. Epictetus's teachings remind us that wealth, when pursued without virtue, can become a burden rather than a blessing. Think back to times when money influenced your decisions. Were there moments when you prioritized it over relationships, integrity or health? Conversely, can you recall a time when you used your resources to help someone in need or to invest in something meaningful? Those actions likely brought a deeper sense of fulfillment than any material possession ever could. Curiosity leads us to question, how can we redefine our relationship with wealth? What if we viewed it not as an end goal, but as a means to live in alignment with our values? Epictetus's wisdom encourages us to seek richness in character, not just in bank accounts. Number 9. Living with purpose. Remembering life's fragility. Life is fleeting. It's a truth we all know but often avoid confronting. For Epictetus, acknowledging life's fragility wasn't morbid, it was liberating. He believed that by remembering the impermanence of life, we could find clarity, focus, and a deeper sense of purpose. Imagine holding a fragile glass in your hands. You cherish it, knowing it could shatter at any moment. This is how Epictetus viewed life. Precious, because it's impermanent. He advised, don't demand that things happen as you wish, but wish that they happen as they do, and you will go on well. By accepting life's unpredictability, we free ourselves from frustration and learn to make the most of every moment. At its core, Living with purpose means aligning your actions with your values. It's about asking yourself what truly matters and letting that guide your decisions. Consider the story of Steve Jobs, who, after being diagnosed with cancer, spoke about how confronting his mortality gave him a clearer sense of what was important. It's a poignant reminder that our time is limited and how we spend it defines our legacy. Think back to a time when you were acutely aware of life's fragility. Perhaps the loss of a loved one, a near-death experience, or even a poignant moment of reflection. Those moments likely brought a sharp focus on what truly mattered, cutting through the noise of everyday distractions. They may have inspired you to cherish your relationships, pursue your passions, or simply savor the present. Curiosity beckons us to ask, what if we lived every day with that same awareness? How much more meaningful could our lives become if we embraced the fragility of life, not as a source of fear, but as a call to action? Epictetus's teachings remind us that purpose isn't found in seeking permanence, but in making the most of the time we have. Number 10. Contentment. The ultimate wealth of the soul. What does it mean to be truly content? Is it having everything you've ever wanted, or is it realizing you already have enough? For Epictetus, contentment wasn't about external circumstances, but about cultivating a mindset of gratitude and sufficiency. He believed that the soul's true wealth lies in being at peace with what you have. Picture a quiet evening sitting under a starry sky. There's no noise, no distractions, just a profound sense of calm. This is the essence of contentment, a state of being that doesn't depend on possessions or achievements, but on inner harmony. Epictetus taught, wealth consists not in having great possessions, but in having few wants. By lowering our expectations and appreciating what we have, we can find joy in the simplest of things. At its core, Contentment is about shifting focus from what's missing to what's present. In a world driven by consumerism, 
This can feel counterintuitive. Advertisements constantly tell us that happiness is just one purchase away. But how often has acquiring something new brought lasting fulfillment? True contentment, as Epictetus reminds us, comes from within, not from external acquisitions. Nostalgia takes us back to simpler times, perhaps childhood, when happiness came from a sunny day, a favorite toy, or the company of loved ones. Back then, contentment wasn't tied to wealth or status. It was found in moments of presence and connection. As adults, we often complicate this, chasing goals that leave us perpetually unsatisfied. Curiosity invites us to wonder, what if we stopped chasing and started appreciating? What if we measured wealth not by what we own, but by the peace we feel? Epictetus's teachings challenge us to redefine success, urging us to seek fulfillment in the riches of the soul rather than the trappings of the material world. As we wrap up this journey into the timeless wisdom of Epictetus, take a moment to reflect on what resonated most with you. Whether it was the value of humility, finding peace in simplicity, or living with purpose, these lessons remind us that true strength lies in mastering our inner world. Life is unpredictable, but your mindset is your most powerful tool to navigate it. Remember, the first step toward transformation begins with action. If you've made it this far, drop a hundred in the comments. It shows you're part of the rare 0.01% who commit to self-improvement till the end. And if you're serious about leveling up your life, don't forget to hit subscribe and join our growing community. Together, we're building a life rooted in wisdom, purpose and resilience. Let's rise above and thrive.